What happens if you duplicate the data used in ordinary list squares linear regression? You can encounter this problem in many forms. The one I first received was asking particularly how the t-statistic changes, but you can get it under other formulations. We look at the most common variables related to regression and how they change under the multiplied samples. We start by taking a peek at how linear regression works, but you can skip this section and head straight to the proof if you are confident you are familiar with the concepts. Linear regression aims to fit a line, or plane, or hyperplane, to the data, explaining a relationship between the dependent and independent variables. Then, we can use it to infer or forecast new values. Formally, assume there is a linear relationship between y, the dependent variable, and x, the independent one. In the univariate case, this looks something like this. We can see the regression equation, which is linear in its coefficients beta. The remaining piece that alters this relationship is an unobserved random variable, the error term. To proceed from here, we have to assume a series of facts about the relationship between the known and unknown variables. I will broach how they might not hold when we double the sample size. The logical next step is to estimate the values of the parameter beta. The difference between the actual and estimated values is called the residual. We want to select the estimators in such a way that we minimize the sum of squared residuals. Fitting the line to the points means that, as we said before, we minimize the sum of squared residuals, the red lines in this graph Moving the line around by changing the values of beta 0 and beta 1, we can arrive at the optimal one. Intuitively, having duplicate points in the same positions should not have an impact on this line. At this point, we know the components that can describe a regression problem, and we can start thinking better about what might change when we duplicate the dataset. The goal is to provide answers to the following queries. Does the estimated optimal function and coefficients change? Do the measures of quality of fit change? Does our confidence in our estimators change? The first regression is modeling y as x times beta. The formula of the OLS estimator is the following. The second regression undergoes the following change in x and y respectively. They have a copy stacked on top of the original values. The shape of the parameter beta doesn't change. We can compare it with the previous value. Using matrix multiplication rules, compute the product of the last two terms, since matrix multiplication is associative. Each element is double the corresponding one in the matrix x transpose y, producing a change in the formula for the first regression. How do the remaining components of the formula change? Now that we know how to multiply stacked matrices, we get the result quickly. Double the corresponding product from the initial formula. But this is before inverting the product. So the first element is half the one above. By combining the two, we obtain the same OLS estimator as when training over the original dataset. As we intuited when looking at the drawing, the estimators do not change. There is no new information added. Nevertheless, are they better at estimating the values of y? Can they even be, given that we add no additional information? Is the change in sample size enough to have an impact here? The goodness of fit measure summarizes the discrepancy between the observed and predicted values. The most famous and used is the coefficient of determination, or the so-called R-squared. It measures the proportion of the variation in the dependent variable that is predicted from the independent ones. It intuitively follows that regression 2 does not explain more of the variance in y than regression 1. Using the definition of R-squared, we write it as 1 minus the unexplained variance, computed as the sum of squared errors, 
divided by the explained variance, the sum of squared differences between the vector y and the mean of y. If the predictions were perfect, the unexplained variance would be 0 and r squared would be 1. Conversely, if the model predicts only the mean of the independent variable, the coefficient of determination would be 0. With a context set, we can check if the intuition that r squared is invariant holds up. Since the regression equation is the same, the predictions are as well. At the same time, the mean of y stays constant. So, the r squared is constant under data duplication. One drawback of this measure is that it is susceptible to inflation caused when adding new explanatory variables. One attempt at solving this problem is the correction proposed by Mordecai Zekiel, which divides each sum of squares by the corresponding degrees of freedom, n minus 1 and n minus p minus 1. Since the formula uses the degrees of freedom, the value of the adjusted r square might change due to data duplication. The adjustment coefficient for the second regression increases, resulting in a larger adjusted r square. One thing to remember is that beta hat merely estimates the values governing the linear relationship between y and x. This means we want to measure how confident we are in them. The most common measure is a 1 minus alpha confidence interval. We need the estimate, the z score, and the standard deviation to compute it. Now we have to return to the ignored assumptions needed to derive the estimators. One such postulation is that the distribution of the errors conditional on the regressors is normal. Hence, the variance of y given x is sigma squared times the identity matrix. We are fortunate enough we have a closed form solution for the estimates of beta that we plug into the variance. Using the formula for computing the variance of constant matrix multiplication, we get the result for betas. They depend only on the matrix X and the variance of the errors given X. There are a couple of estimates for the variance of errors, both involving the sum of squares. One divides it by the number of samples, the maximum likelihood one, and the other divides it by n minus p, the unbiased one. We will use the former. Now we can compare the estimates variance between the two regressions. The standard deviation of the errors is the same since we double the sum and the denominator changes from n to 2n. The product of the matrices is the same as the one we computed before, so the variance is halved. In conclusion, when doubling the data, we reduce the standard deviation by a factor of square root of 2. The changes in confidence are as follows. The standard error decreases by a factor of square root of 2, as well as the length of the confidence interval. Consequently, the t-statistic will increase by the same ratio, decreasing the p-value accordingly. Unfortunately, the supposed added confidence is an illusion. We did not add any new information to the model when doubling the data and are violating the necessary conditions for the linear regression needed to make these computations. While there are some areas of statistics where this practice is in use, it's good to keep in mind that we need independence of observations to interpret the results of a least squares regression. To put all the changes in perspective, we can load one of the many sklearn datasets and test that the changes we theorized take place. The same coefficients and r squared, increased adjusted r squared, and increased confidence in the coefficient estimates. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video, there are a few more like this one waiting for you. 
If you haven't seen them, or if you did and want to watch them again, here are some that might pique your interest. See you next time!